We're collapsing in the pre-market. I don't have the lines to hold this much size. The bell rings in five minutes. Get me a home for the paper. Okay, first, let's take a deep breath and calm down and put a bit of reggae music to help us. This is Industry Season 2, Episode 2, and it's the key trade that will define the series. No one's gonna call. It's not accepted. I didn't know this desk ran on blind faith. So the CPS team at Pierpoint is in trouble. They have a lot of shares in the trader's book that they need to get rid of in the next few minutes before the market opens. Four minutes, I puked this paper into the market. Eat the loss and never forgive any of you. First, let's try to figure out what's happening here. As of now, I'm the proud owner of 75 million shares of Brighton. As handsome and inspirational as I am, I'm not a captain of industry. We've got 75 million shares. We have exclusively negotiated with one of these firms to apply their blocks a 3% discount placed with their clients. Maybe they have a fee from the seller, the private equity firm, and therefore the incentive is all for the client. But I think it's more likely that the bank has a greater discount and can play with it. The last trade price was 45. We don't know if this last trade is the close of the day before or if it's something that has just been trading in the pre-market the hour before the market officially opens, if we apply a 3% discount to that, we get 43.65. To keep it simple, let's just say this is our break-even point. My budget on this book is 100 million, 100 bars. I think Rishi means his overall budget is $100 million, which kind of makes sense. I'm simply not taking a wash and a half of that, losing 50 fucking bars. He talks about losing 50 bars or 50 million, and it's not clear where it comes from. If he's got 75 million shares at 45, it means that losing 50 million is about 1.5%. I would say here, the risk is much greater than that. I mean, the market can move by two, 3% very quickly. Luckily for them, this meeting happened before. Right, can healthcare, huge block, discounted price. Hey, one minute. Harper met this guy, let's call him a hedge fund guy, Bloom and told him the following information. No longer has an anchor. Let's make that you. Now, this is quite crazy. She's giving him material, confidential information that the hedge fund can really use. Is there a specialist interest? But this is not too bad. That is. Anna Futured On, not yet confirmed, but looks likely she already owns it, is looking to add. No money. So now the hedge fund knows the name of the other buyers and that there's no anchor. So let's say hypothetically... Look, I don't, I don't deal in the subjunctive condition. Say hypothetically, he gets in touch with Anna and says, I think we can buy the shares much cheaper than that. He could short as early as possible. Now the bank would not have these significant buyers because they agreed between themselves. And the stock tanks. Rishi realizes that it could easily wipe him out completely. He has to sell as much as possible quickly and that could further tank the price. So Harper should definitely not provide this information to a hedge fund, but luckily it doesn't go that way. Okay, can I get back to my lesson or you got an ice scraper for my windshield if you want to sell me? Then there's a trade. Unknown number. Hi Harper, it's Jesse Bloom. Hi Jesse. They don't have a trading relationship yet with Bloom and his company, right? So are you allowed to trade? My answer would probably be no. Sick of commenting on the direction of the wind. Shall we make it blow? They can probably trade over mobile, but I think it's a very, very loose policy from Pierpont. It's not very realistic. What have you learned about our friend Anna and her interests? There's a fun scene with Yasmin from FX as Harper needs to go through to Anna, but we're skipping it. Harper is now on the phone with Anna. Yes, we have a mismatched FX trade that my back office is having trouble getting in contact with yours to confirm. We booked Pierpoint buys 250 mil quid at 136.62 value spot. Quid is a slang term for the pound. It's not normally used on a trading desk. I think they got it confused with Cable, the nickname for the GBP USD currency pair. The UK pound versus the US dollar. If Pierpoint bought the pound, the client sold it. And I thought that didn't make sense because the company trades in London, so it trades in pound, and the client needs pounds to buy it. Absolutely not. The direction is right, but the notional is wrong. I specifically bought $250 million, which I intend to put to work. But she says, no, I bought US dollar for dollar amount of $250 million. Anna isn't in the book yet, but she is buying at the open. How does she choose to buy at the open? 
where she could have a 3% discount and that was her whole reason to buy. How can you be sure? Her flagship fund is sterling denominated and when she wants to buy a US asset, she has to raise the dollar. I think there's a double confusion here in the mind of the writers. So let's take it that indeed she bought $250 million and Riken trades in dollars, but then it would be listed in New York or London. So we're moving on to the trade. How much stock does your trader have now and where is it? He had 75 million a few minutes ago. I'm stuck with 50 million. The last trade price was 45. I can sell you all 50 million at that price. The only other order we knew was Anna. So she might have already placed an order. But then why did Rishi not know that she had bought the shares. I'll buy 75 million, not 50. 75 million at 44 and a half. 75 million at 44 and a half. 70. Let's play close attention to this. This will take me short of fuck that. Okay, Jesse, how about this? Why don't we do 50 now and we'll leave a working order for 25 more after the open? What's very confusing or maybe very clever from Rishi is what follows next. 50 million at 44 and three quarters. Yours. 50 million at 44 and three quarters. Done. Fine. He says 44 and three quarters, but the client said 44.50. 75 million at 44 and half. 75. That's a nice 25 bips on 50 million shares that he pocketed just by magic, or, or, or maybe the client shouldn't trade 3 billion worth of shares while playing tennis. Eric, got Fellam on line one. Tell him he's in a queue now and his order will have to wait. They saved the day, but now it's a weird position for Rishi's book. He needs to buy 25 million shares more, an additional $1 billion of Notional. And Felim was going to buy the 15 million shares, and he's placing an order for 50 million. So the position has been completely inverted. Now he needs to buy 75 million shares. It's quite, it's quite the ride. But let's also think about Rishi, who was panicking earlier. Move this paper into the market, eat the loss, and never forgive any of you. He just sold 50 million shares at 44.75. We assumed, maybe wrongly, that his break-even price was 43.65. He made $1.1 on 15 million shares. He made $55 million in profit. Although he's been panicking, he's done 50 million, like half his budget for the year in one trade. I'm not very clear on that. So this is quite a fantastic financial scene. It's very exciting. It's not very realistic. There are a lot of things that don't add up, but I really enjoyed it. Even if the writers messed it up a bit, you have to really give them credit to make this scene so relatable. I hope you enjoy this. There's gonna be a lot more from this channel, so please subscribe. And I would love to hear if you know a scene from a movie or a series that you would like me to analyze. Thank you.